The address is CBS. Welcome home. Friends, welcome back, everybody. I'm T.S., and the color cast is on the air now. It is Wednesday night, the 23rd of September, 1998. Dr. Laura, the most popular person in all of radio in America, is here tonight, and the great country music star Waylon Jennings and stories along the way, and you on the toll-free. It was nice to see the market up 257, 258 points today. You know, as my run comes to an end here early in 1999, mm -hmm. this is not the time for the market to begin going down. You know, my little, uh, my little screw you fund is fine, but uh, <clears throat> if it turns into a, 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 a bear market, it's screw me. See, <laughs> we don't want that to happen. Yeah. In any event, uh, we're on only one minute late tonight here on CBS. You know what's great about CBS? Like last night, we were, what, 25, 26 minutes late. Tonight, we're a minute. Yeah, 19 last night. You never know when you're coming on here. They, 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 they have a guy out there with a megaphone in the hallway. They say... Two minutes, Tom. I said, okay, be right in. <laughs> anyway, what I thought we'd do tonight before we get to uh, Dr. Laura and Waylon Jennings is answer uh, some viewer email that comes in uh, via computer here to our office and is handled by uh, Joseph Ruggiero, uh, my assistant here at uh, CBS. And here is, as they say, the first letter that we'll answer tonight. These are just letters. Now, this is not intended to be a laugh riot or you know, anything like, like last night, the laugh riot. Yeah. <laughs> Zebra. 26 sizes larger than an A bra. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Not that I want to sound like Jerry Seinfeld, but why do the local TV stations carry the live traffic updates on the 5 and 5.30 p.m. newscast and also in the morning? Do that many people have TVs in their office to watch what their commute home will be like? Don't most people get their information on the radio once they're in the car? Am I the only one who finds this strange? Love your show. Best wishes to your mom. Sincerely, Linda. P.S. I work at 30 Rock. You know, Linda, I've often thought of this myself. You know, I watch my favorite uh, uh, traffic caster, Paul Johnson, on KNBC here in the morning and the afternoon. I thought, who, who, who's he talking to? Because people get the information in their cars. So why put it on TV? And incidentally, if you're in the car, they're never talking about traffic where you are. It's always where somebody else is. Uh, here's the second letter. Dear Tom, thought you might get a charge out of this. I got this from a net newsletter, quote, Public media should not contain explicit or implied descriptions of sex acts. Our society should be purged of the perverts who provide the media with pornographic material while pretending it has some redeeming social value under the public's right to know. That quote apparently is from Kenneth Starr, appearing in the 1987 interview on 60 Minutes with Diane Sawyer. Huh? Thank you for your work and your honesty, Susan, Cleveland, Ohio. Susan, thank you for sending that to our attention. Uh, dear Mr. Snyder, uh, this is email number three. I enjoyed your show tonight. I managed, this is, she's referring now to last night's epic, which uh, appeared late on the network. Uh, she says, I managed to keep myself awake for the entire show. You are definitely worth staying up for. Well, thank you. I enjoyed your opening banter tremendously. It was abundantly clear that Mr. Kennedy enjoyed it also. There was no sign of the Titanic sinking last night. I just hope that Mr. Kennedy survived the opening without rupturing anything or having a depends moment. <laughs> It sounded like he was having a hard time coming up for air. Sincerely, Carol Brown. Carol, we've become used to Mr. Kennedy's moments of all kinds on this program. <laughs> Last night, there was nothing untoward. Finally, hi, Tom. I hope you haven't heard this yet. The Surgeon General has said that all cigar manufacturers must post the following morning on all cigar packages. Caution. Cigars may cause cervical cancer. I'm Tom. You're watching CBS, and thank you for catching our pictures as we fly them through the air. <laughs> Dr. Laura's radio program is heard by millions of people who tune in every day to get her take on morality and how to establish quality in their lives. Her blunt style and sharp answers have earned her some critics, but if her huge radio audience is any indication, Dr. Laura has millions and millions of fans. Her newest book is The Ten Commandments, The Significance of God's Laws in Everyday Life, 
And it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Laura back to our program here at CBS, and thanks for coming on. I always like to be here with Thank you. Thank you. Now, you know, in reading about you uh, this afternoon, and in going through your book, your outlook on life has changed a great deal since you began broadcasting on radio, hasn't mm -hmm. it? What, what's changed in Dr. Laura's life? Well, I was in college in the 60s, yep. so I was a secular feminist. Had no concept of holy or sacred. I was brought up with no religion in the family. And, you know, ethics and, you know, appropriate behavior, right. decent behavior. Mm -hmm. But the issue of holiness in areas was not my frame of reference. And so getting the license and practicing psychotherapy and all of that had a very secular viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I mean, there would be times I can remember thinking back on my show where somebody would call in and part of the call would be that they'd start talking about religion or God. Don't go there. Don't go Already? there. No. You know, because I, at that time in my life, that was like Twilight Zone, silly stuff. I didn't want any And when you say secular feminist, that religion wasn't a part of your life, mm -hmm. but were you, were you an, an active feminist and were you one of those who, uh, you know, men were bad or men were somehow keeping women down and that men were not to be trusted? Was it that kind of feminism in which you believed at the time? No, I, I never went over the edge. Okay. And I was a science major. I didn't have time to go out and <laughs> make a fuss about things. But it was this, uh, you know, power in your job is everything and getting married and having kids was sort of a cop-out mm -hmm. uh, it, it robbed too many women of the pleasure and joy of their own femininity and an appreciation of the dualistic and very important synergistic relationship with men to me it was very anti-men anti-family anti-children and where did where along the way did religion find you or did you find religion or was it a marriage of the two I think it came and got me really ah uh, when we got married and had Derek, I mean, the miracle of having a person growing inside mm -hmm. my body. Creating life, right. It was so astonishing to me. I mean, I had taught it in biology classes, so I was intellectually aware. But that's not the same thing as feeling little feet and arms <laughs> inside of right. you. And uh, it just seemed too complex, too miraculous, too wonderful, too intricate to be an accident of molecules so that was the beginning and then right. having Derek and realizing how overwhelming and dictatorial a baby is uh, that your whole life is turned over it is sacrificed in a way to nurture and love and support and protect mm -hmm. and take care of this little person that that gave me a big notion of living for something more magnificent outside of what I want where I want to go what I right. want to do what okay. I want to have and then as he got older uh, we were watching a PBS together, and uh, up comes a Holocaust program with um, a voiceover of how it was Nazi filmage. It's the upsetting the now. The horrible scenes yeah, of women and children and being men shot being into, shot and, and, and put into shallow And grave. Derek says, and my hand was frozen on the remote control, and Derek says, what's going on? Yeah. And what do you tell a six-year-old? And I explained the best I could, and who are they? Uh, they're Jews. And who are Jews? Those are our people. Jews are us. Yeah. And he said, what's a Jew? And I said, I don't know. But I'm going to start finding out. Because I was not brought up with any religion at all, but I identified religiously. My mother was uh, Catholic from Italy. My father was a Jewish boy from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. But there was no religion in the family at all, yet I identified that way. And that began our journey religiously until the whole family So converted. all of this then would change your outlook and your attitude mm -hmm. when, you, when you get on the air. Mm -hmm. And you're, are, are, how are you a different person on air now from when I first met you, God, 10, 15 years ago when you subbed for uh, Sally Jesse Raphael right. on, on ABC Radio right. here in Los Angeles? Well, the perspective was very much on practicalities mm -hmm. and uh, I think egocentrism to some point because that was very supported by the culture which said even the, you know, the bone I've had to pick with my own profession is instead of leading so often, it follows the politically correct. So uh, that whole notion of you live for what satisfies and aggrandizes you, and then when you're happy, there's some trickle-down theory, which is so obnoxious. And uh, more just the, the, the psychotherapy vantage point. And uh, the first book I wrote in this arena was How Could You Do That? And that was after years and years and years on the air, growing and maturing, and seeing that more often than not, the problems that people had in their lives were not so much psychological mm -hmm. as character and philosophy and not having a sense of what makes life purposeful and, and how to decide 
what's right and what's wrong. What framework do you use? Your own, the gray areas, the rationalizations, or something absolute? We're seeing a great deal of discussion these days about character, mm -hmm. obviously, with what's in the news. And we're seeing a great, a great deal of discussion about, uh, here's that commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, uh, about exactly what that is. I mean, we've seen the President of the United States, FUMFA, through a number of definitions of what in his mind constitute sexual intercourse. Uh, what about this commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery? Well, what does that mean to you? It's so profound a notion. It's not just, listen, you got married, you shouldn't be having sex with anybody. Right. It is more complex in terms of making the sex between two people something safe and something sacred. And not only that, it provides stability within the family, within the extended family, and within the culture. I mean, you see, we've talked before on this program sure. about the overwhelming instability you see in kids' lives. I mean, people call the show now, I married, I had that kid divorced, they had kids, we got yeah. together, now we have his, hers, ours, these are visiting, these actually live here. This is chaos for kids. And so the notion that certain things are special and should be confined, and that always seems like a negative word, to something very special in a committed relationship, provides stability for both people to feel safe with each other and for children to grow up without feeling without being crass about sex and intimacy and without being cynical. What, 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 what do young people think based upon the feedback you get from the people who, who listen to you on the radio and interact with you? What kind of signals are coming out of the White House with this thing? Right well, now? you know, the teenagers are feeling vindicated. You're telling them they're bad, they're wrong, they're this, they're that. You can elevate yourself to President of the United States and do this for your entire married life. This is very sad. I, I believe that people in positions of authority and responsibility, you and me mm -hmm. in our respective, much less a president, ha have, have a responsibility and we are accountable to set a standard. It isn't all about uh, signing some treaty with a country. That, that part is very important too, or a bill for something here, but it is setting the tone for a nation which then lives within the confines of those rules. And if you think about it, and what struck me immediately, because I'm not very big on the political things, is that this is the first father in the first family. We call this the first family. That represents something. Right. And what devastates me emotionally is what this does to all the families out there trying to explain to their kids, be good, work hard, and you can grow up to be president. Oh, good. Uh, aside from that, my heart goes out to uh, Chelsea. And on the air, what do you say about this? Do you... Do you make any political comments? Do you get no, involved in the politics I, at all? No, I have not said anything on the show about you it. You should quit or shouldn't quit? For the, or... No, I, I, for the longest while, I said absolutely nothing because since he did not admit to anything in public, it was all innuendo and gossip. And gossiping is very forbidden in, in Jewish tradition. Once he made his statement... It may be forbidden in tradition, but it's <laughs> often used in practice. <laughs> That's unfortunate, but most of the commandments are broken in practice. True. You know? let, me, let me take a fast break. We're chatting here with Dr. Laura. Her book is called The Ten Commandments. We'll be right back with uh, Dr. Laura. You on the toll-free as time permits. After these words from our sponsors. We are back on the air with Dr. Laura. Here is Dee on the toll-free in Durham, North Carolina. Hi, Dee, and welcome to CBS Late Night. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, actually, I want to say I love Dr. Laura's program. Okay. I listen all the time, and I agree with almost everything she says. Almost but, everything, okay. Um, I guess the main thing is the style. Sometimes it's almost painful to listen. It almost feels as if she's just hammering these people into the ground, degrading them. And I think her point would get much further if it just uh, maybe wasn't so crude. Um, I, may, I, may I say, in her defense, okay, and I'm sure she'll speak to your point, but I, I, I find listening to Dr. Laura, which I do quite often when I'm driving between Los Angeles and San Francisco, she does get exasperated with people who, who, who she makes a point and people begin to argue with her, and her program is not about arguments. No, it's, it's a moral health show. It's not a mental health show. I'm not trying to make anybody feel better at the moment. I'm trying to help them be better. And, of course, the kinds of things that will, will happen in a program like that when I'm trying to get a point across for somebody is, is not the sort of discourse you'd have over tea. 
And I think that the bluntness of talking about what is right and what is wrong and what we need to do to be more decent people in this day and age is seen as offensive in of itself. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I can see that. I guess um, to get a point across to people, they should be more decent. Dee, I've heard, I've heard women and men call Dr. Laura in the most outlandish uh, <laughs> social and sexual predicaments and think it's all perfectly normal. And when she tells them how abnormal it is, they persist in saying, but no, it really is normal, and let me tell you why. <laughs> and after about 10 minutes, I mean, even the good doctor does begin to lose her, her, her cool, and I don't blame her. Oh, I totally agree. I, well, I I'm genuine to the moment. If somebody needs slurping and support, they get slurp and support. Yes, they do. If somebody needs to be smacked aside the head, they're going to get that, too. Uh, I was described by a sociologist in San Diego on a television program, and I thought this was remarkable. He, he described me as a very good friend who would tell you the truth, even when it hurts, because that's the only way to help you mm -hmm. magnify the decent part of you and minimize, minimize the other. Dee, I'm glad you called, and thanks for watching our program. Okay, thank you. All right, good night, young lady. Uh, one more question about mm -hmm. this Clinton thing, and then I want to move on to other commandments. Uh, on the Larry King program, uh, and I just saw a transcript. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear these words come from your mouth, but the transcript indicated that you said that Mon you felt that Monica Lewinsky was totally responsible for this entire incident. No, it, no I never said no, that. Okay. No, you know I would never say I, that. I couldn't imagine you saying no, that. No, I said she's responsible for her own behavior. Right. That the incidents happened, they both contributed to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because she certainly didn't rape him. Just seeking clarification. <laughs> <laughs> I would never. Well, it say all depends that. on what you mean by rape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it all depends on what you mean by the word alone. So. Yes, it depends exactly how you define it. How about this commandment? And here's one we don't hear much about these days. Honor thy father and thy mother. Mm -hmm. Not love them, but honor thy father and thy mother. Where's that one going? Uh, good question. As we have gotten more and more egocentric, it has gone by the wayside. And also, I think pop psychology has given much too much leeway that when parents are just annoying, <laughs> Uh, that they should somehow be shunned. Uh, and I say on the air all the time when people call and they're crumbing about their parents yep. or their mother-in-law and father-in-law, and I say, okay, are they evil or just annoying? Because if they're just annoying, you are obligated by God's law to do certain things. Doesn't mean you're feeling very close, doesn't mean you feel love, but you're responsible to behave in a certain way. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's not love them, not no. even agree with them, but honor them as your father and your because mother. Because they are, they were in the triangle with God in your creation, and for the generations to carry the notions of godliness, we need the connection to be maintained. And that's what stands between you and God. I remember living in New York some years ago on one of the television stations, maybe even more than one, at 10 o'clock every night they put up a slide with a clock face saying, it's 10 p.m., do you know where your children are? Yes. Which, which was a good campaign. Yes. But I never saw one that said, it's 10 p.m., have you called your mother and father to tell them where you are? That you, is good. You know, it's a two-way street, that mother, father, and, chi and, and, and child. And while we have responsibilities to make sure of the safety, well-being, and comfort of our children, mm -hmm. they also have a responsibility to let us know they're okay when they escape our total control in teenage years. This is true. Well said. Oh, thank you. Thank you very kind. <laughs> what about your own mother and father? I know you, your mom well, my, was uh, my your, dad's your dad. mom was Catholic, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and an Italian lady, and uh, that brings a smile to my face. And your father was a Brooklyn boy. Nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn, and he was a uh, second lieutenant in the American Army, liberating Italy. I guess he took it literally. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where you met your mother? Yeah. And uh, what about your mom? How did, did did you and she have a nice? Uh, often mothers and daughters have frictions. Well, you know, one of the ways that I tell people that they honor their parents is, is not to gossip about personal family things in a public arena. Uh, I find that the spate of memoirs and mommy dearest and daddy dearest are just so offensive as people blame parents and circumstances, which are probably not even related to their own behaviors, mm -hmm. to try to excuse rather than take responsibility. So I think more and more people in the public eye should, should be more circumspect about revealing privacies that, that belong in, with that word. Which says nothing at all about how you got along with your mother. That's correct, because I don't gossip about people. Well, I mean, I, did, uh, do you love your mom? I don't discuss the family life. That's private. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You talked about you and your son watching television. That, yeah. that wasn't private, but your mother is Well, private. you were asking the description about how we got to that point, and yeah. Okay. Just want to differentiate. Okay. okay. Not trying to pry into your life. <laughs> Believe That's all right. me. Okay. 
Let me let me go back here to this business of, of, of lying, which mm -hmm. is also in the news. And, and I heard a man on television the other day say there are gradations of lies. There are lies told to, to cover up murder, to cover up killing, to cover up evil. Then there are lies that are told to protect family, to protect reputation, uh, to, to protect oneself. Is, is, is there, in your view, a gradation of lie, or is a lie a lie a lie a lie? Well, it was a cute Peanuts cartoon, and I can't remember what the names of the characters were, but I just remember one said to the other, I didn't know lies came in colors, you know, the white <laughs> lies. I thought that was very sweet. In under Jewish tradition, everything that is true doesn't need to be spoken. But when you tell a lie, these can be very devastating, mm -hmm. okay? It is, it is expected that you would tell a lie to preserve someone's life. Somebody's right. chasing somebody with a gun. Mm -hmm. You do not tell them where they are when you know where they are. Or the, the Frank family is not upstairs. Exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. Uh, but when people call me on the air and say, I'm just trying to be honest with such and such, okay, I said, okay, I'll be honest back. You're ugly. So all truths don't need to now be spoken. Now we know what Dee was talking about on the phone. <laughs> well, it <laughs> makes the point. Yes, it does. Yes, it uh, does. All truths don't need to be spoken. And you have to consider the hierarchy of things. And sometimes it's better not to speak in order to not cause hurt or pain mm -hmm. unnecessarily. But, don't but to hide ill-doing is only self-serving. Oh, I understand that. But, yeah. I, but you and I both would agree that there are white lies that are told every day in social dialogue that allow this society to exist. Exactly. If we walked into a friend's home who had invited us for dinner and told the truth of how we enjoyed the dinner, they would never speak to no, us again on some occasion. you find social, the, the caring about the, the spirit of the other person and the well-being of their home and the relationship, you find, but you, you don't have to lie. You can find something good to say. I can't tell you how many times at a friend's house for dinner I've said, you know, I've never tasted anything quite like like that before. <laughs> yeah, but if they're a friend, they know you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I can't believe you cook that right here in your own kitchen. You find, <laughs> and, or that you would dare. You find a way to say it that's a blessing. You teach your exactly. children that Aunt, Aunt Mary sent some really ugly thing or some dumb, stupid thing that the kid doesn't want. You call her up and you go, how loving of you to take the time to send me something. Send me this crap, yeah. No! <laughs> So you teach them how to find the blessing, because when you think about it, that's one of the problems adults have. They're so grousy, covetous, Tenth Commandment, yep. on what they don't have, and so ungrateful for the blessings they have, uh, that they're not enjoying life at all. So if you teach children at a young age, even when you're disappointed there's a blessing, I think they come out healthier adults. I agree. We continue with Dr. Laura and you on the Toll Free right after this short break. We continue with Dr. Laura. Here's Dominic on the phone in Philadelphia. Hi, Dom. Welcome to CBS. Hello. Dom, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. How are you? Very good. Nice to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Hello, uh, Dr. Laura. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Pretty good. Good. Uh, my friends and I listen to your show from time to time, driving down the road or sitting on the beach and enjoy it and sometimes get a kick out of your curtness <laughs> and directness at times. Um, I heard you a little earlier mention something you don't like to talk about your family. It's private. That was before I had, after I had my question. Mm -hmm. um, my dad is on a radio station. He's born again Christian. He's on a 20-minute segment of a religious radio station. And I was wondering if your child may somewhat feel uh, at times pressured by your stand on morality and things that you discuss, if that may affect his personal life. That's a good question. And uh, you would imagine my family talks a lot <laughs> and uh, he's very open very direct mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's genetic and very blunt about his feelings okay. and you see but he's grown up within this family so having this the a sense that there are values beyond what you want uh, is normal for him so okay. something will come on television when we're all hanging out and watching together and he'll go oh, mom change the channel it's inappropriate uh, and, uh, yeah, I call him our little rabbi. Okay. <laughs> Keeps me in line. Is there any murder he's allowed to get away with? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm using murder in the, in the figurative sense, you know. Uh, you, you, uh, does he get away with stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm, a, -year -old I'm kid, a pretty, you know. you know, rigorous person about yeah. how things ought to be done. Yeah. He's so cute. Yeah, yeah. He oh, I know he's a, he's a very good-looking young man, but, he's I mean, you've got to let a little guy get away with murder once in a while. You know, he's got to be a guy. Well, uh... 
my husband and I were talking about this yesterday. I can't stand the pants, but I'm coping. My husband doesn't like the hair. I think it's adorable. So <laughs> I guess everybody has personal okay, taste. All right. Dom, I'm glad, Dominic, I'm glad you called. Thank you for watching our show tonight, sir. Thank you. Okay, good night, young Have man. Good night. Bye-bye. The last time you were here, you talked about this radio program. You do, what is it, three hours a day, mm -hmm. five days a week? Mm -hmm. It's intense programming sometimes because you're dealing with people who are often on the verge or on the brink of it. Oh, a, no, a, no. Uh, people who are on verges and on brinks don't get on the air. No? No. No, well, my screener has been with me for a decade, and when somebody's frail, fragile, vulnerable, terribly upset about something, the radio show is not the place to deal with it, so okay. she'll give them a hotline number. Okay, but when you deal with people who are in intense personal situations, would that That's be... just about how everybody, everybody feels well, tense yeah. about their situation. Does any of that rub off on you? Like when, when you leave sometimes at the end of a three-hour broadcast, are you drained sometimes? Just, oh, man, well, tough day today. No, I'm sort of energized because I look at it very positively. Whatever they came in with, they had the opportunity to try to turn it around and make it into, as what I said before, something positive, a blessing. The only thing that will upset me, and I can wake up in the middle of the night, is when I talk to kids mm -hmm. sometimes who are, uh, like I had a, a young lady today. Her brother sexually molested her for years. The parents knew about it. He's out of the house. He's not doing well financially. They're going to bring him back in the house. Now, he was never asked to take counseling. He wasn't arrested. Nothing. To me, this is evil. Horror story. Evil. And uh, this will probably wake me up in the middle of the night. Do you ever wonder how long you want to do this? It is something that, you know, how do you make life meaningful? What is the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. I see it primarily as mattering in somebody else's life. So for me, it's very important that I do this because it is how I'm trying to matter, to help other people have better lives that they can enjoy and in their way matter to somebody else. So it's very rewarding for me. Finally, and I told you about this in the break, so it's not a surprise. I've had 25 or 30 emails. Why is Dr. Laura no longer on the advisory board of Skeptic Magazine? I didn't even know you were on the advisory board. <laughs> But I guess you've departed from that position for I, I never got asked to advise either, oh, so okay. I guess that was an honorary position. Um, you know, I, I do, if I remove myself from something, it's discreetly. I don't publicly embarrass anybody, talk about it on my show. I'm just sort of quiet about it. I just uh, so you took quietly, some offense at one particular issue. So you quietly withdrew. So I just sent a little note, love you desperately, please take my name off the internet. Very good. Thank you for answering that because it will save me a lot of email okay. tomorrow, okay? Dr. Laura is the guest. The book is called The Ten Commandments, The uh, uh, Significance of God's Laws in Everyday Life. It's on the stands right now, and uh, you certainly know this lady because you listen to her by the millions every single day. And I thank you again for joining My us pleasure. tonight. My okay. pleasure. Next, the great country music star Waylon Jennings. We'll be right back with Mr. Jennings after this break. I'm going to read for you now the intro that I have for Waylon Jennings, the great country music superstar. But what you have to know is I just found out on the break here, as Dr. Laura was leaving the broadcast center, Waylon Jennings walked out of here about five or ten minutes ago. He is not here. Now, I've been doing this kind of a show since 1965 in Philadelphia, but I have never had a guy, I've had a guy walk off on the air. Once Mort Saul walked off on me on a, on a local show here in Los Angeles. But I've never had a guest walk out before he or she was introduced to the audience. So now here's what I was going to say about Waylon Jennings, even though he's not here. From Texas disc jockey to country music superstar, Waylon Jennings has touched millions with his songs about life, love, and living through tough times. His, seventh, his 70th album is called Closing In on the Fire, and we are pleased to welcome Waylon Jennings to CBS. And then Brian would take a shot of Waylon, who'd be sitting right here in the chair opposite me. But as you can see, there is, there, there is nobody in the chair. We have no idea where he went, do we? No, I, I swear to God, I've been doing this since 1955 as a kid out in Wisconsin uh, uh, on radio. I have never had anybody leave before they came on. I don't know what it was I said with Dr. Laura or what it was in the intro. And I was dying to ask him, like tonight we had the Country Music Awards here on CBS, and, you know, and I guess he wasn't there and I was dying to ask him, you know, why weren't you there? We were going to go through the fact that he survived a quadruple bypass and a stroke. Uh, he'd been suffering with asthma. He had a great friendship with Johnny Cash. They were, uh, they were uh, bedmates in the hospital. He had some great stories about that. 
He uh, traveled through radio in Texas as a young man, did small-time Texas radio for many years, had all kinds of uh, different jobs. Uh, he had stories about the time he met President Clinton. I, mean, I could go on and on here, but the sad fact of the matter is Waylon Jennings is not here. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy and the staff and I are here all by ourselves. And as I speak to you here, and they're in the control room now hoping I speak for many, many minutes more because they don't have a clue. And it's not their fault. I mean, you know, we had a show all prepared here. And the guy just got on the elevator and left. It's unbelievable. Yes. It's never happened to Johnny, did it? No. No. It didn't happen to Dave. No. It didn't happen to Conan. No. It didn't happen to Jack Parr. Just, just here. It was Parr who walked off. The host walked off, not the guest. Anyway. So we won't be hearing from Waylon Jennings on Closing In on the Fire. And uh, we won't be asking him why he wasn't at the Country Music Awards. And I'm going to take about a two and a half, three minute break now. And uh, we're going to try and figure out something because we have to last. How long before we can go home? It's 15 or 20 minutes, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, something like that. So it'll either be meet the staff night or <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to Mr. Kennedy or, you know, bring out the producers or, you know, whatever, whatever we figure out. And if you have suggestions as to what you'd like to see happen after the next three minutes, <laughs> This would be a great time to call 800-952-2788 because we don't have a damn clue. We'll be right back after these messages. Thank you very much. After all of this time, he's still the best friend of mine. One of a kind. Well, now a little bit of information is starting to filter in, as it always does after the fact. Apparently, uh, Mr. Jennings uh, was told that Dr. Laura would be on for about five or six minutes, and then he, Waylon Jennings, would have the balance of the hour. And when Dr. Laura entered her seventh minute, <laughs> that, that, that was the end of that. <laughs> you know. Uh, the poor guy, despite the stroke and the and the and the uh, and the uh, the asthma, he still keeps his eye on the watch pretty good. Then we were thinking, you know, Peter LaSalle come out to my exec producer. He said, "Didn't uh, William F. Buck Buckley walk out?" And yeah, he did, from the New York studio. But wasn't it, uh, as my memory uh, serves me, it was because he was confused about the time. He thought it was earlier or later. But I, I know that he was scheduled one night, and 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 he wasn't there. So it has happened before, but I can't recall a time. Uh, in my memory when somebody has been actually in the green room less than 50 feet away from where I sit and we go to get the guy and we look in all the the the, uh, the uh, toilets and he's not oh, I'm, I, 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 well usually people go in for you know to you know a little break before they come out here I was gonna say in the John but I have a friend whose name is John and a brother whose name is John and every time I call the John the John they say don't you mean the toilet so I was grasping for a word there you know it's not easy in my life, you know, but what all that goes on, the bubble of estrogen that I discussed five years ago, and now the guest leaving tonight. In any event, here is Allison on the toll-free in Lampasas, Texas. Hi, Allison, it's Tom. Welcome to CBS. Hello. Hi, Mr. Schneider. How are you doing? I'm fine, Allison. Please call me Tom. How are you doing tonight, young lady? I'm doing just fine. Thank very you very much. Very good. I was just wondering, uh, aside from Oil and Jennings, because I don't imagine it'd be him, um, who you, who you like for your final guest? Well, it wouldn't be Waylon Jennings, no. <laughs> you know, fool me once, uh, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. If I had a pick as to who I would like to close this show with, it would be Jack Nicholson. Okay. But the chances of that happening are very, very, very remote because he doesn't do that sort of thing. <laughs> and, if, and, and if I had a second guest, his name would be Johnny Carson, but there's no way in America he'd do that either. Okay, well, we're sure going to miss you. you well, you're, you're very kind, but you know, Allison, we've been together off and on here for a long, long time, and it's time. Uh, I, I want to graduate from college, okay? Okay, sounds good to me. Allison, thanks for calling, and be well. All right, y'all have a real fine evening. Good night, young lady. Good night. Good night. Uh, now to Kip in Kalamazoo. Hi, Kip, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, hey, Tom, how you doing tonight? I'm fine, thank you. How's everything in Kalamazoo tonight? Oh, great. You know, I used to work back there. Did you? Yeah, I worked at WKZO. Yeah, I know. Uh, we listened to you when you were on the air. Yeah, right. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is, what would you prefer to do more, radio or television? Well, tonight it will be radio. <laughs> <laughs> right this second it will be radio. Uh, it would be radio. Yeah, huh? in fact, it would be radio all the time because it, just to me, radio is a more intimate medium than television. Uh, radio, uh, it's like... 
you and I, Kip, could have a conversation on the radio that we would never have on television because people are watching us here, if you know what uh -huh. I mean. But there's a certain anonymity to radio, and for some reason, I, I, I compare television to the living room of the house and radio to the family room where, or the den where almost anything goes. And it, it just seems to be a more familial, a familial medium to me. Well, I'm going to tell you, we're going to miss you when you go off. Well, you're um, very kind. You're very kind. Because you are the best talk show host that I've ever seen, especially on the Today Show. Well, you're very I kind. I remember you way back then. Mm -hmm. I never did that show, but you're kind, you're, you're, you're kind to say it. I did, I did it as a replacement for, uh, for Brian T. Gumbel. <laughs> right. Well, you're still great. Thank you. But, uh, again, uh, do you have any, what are your plans for the future? You know, Kip, I, I don't have the slightest idea. I want to finish this assignment with as much class as I can, and then I'll figure something else out to do. Well, God bless you. Thank you. And uh, may God be with you. And the same to you, young man. You're very kind. Thanks. Have a good night. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. He hasn't by any chance come back in the building, has he, Waylon? No, sir. No, no. no. Catherine in Birmingham, Alabama. Hi, Catherine. You're on the air. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. I was going to ask you what you intended to do with your time when you got off and the, the man right in front of me got, got beat me to it. That's okay. That's okay. Is there any chance of you getting back on the radio? Oh, I, I would do something. It's just, uh, as I told you when, uh, when this came up, and this has been the longest farewell tour since this, the student prince, for crying out loud. <laughs> um, I just, I, I don't want to be bound by five night a week television anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying, Catherine? I've got a daughter and granddaughter, and I've got my mom, and I've got my life. And this, this coming in here every night, while I love broadcasting uh, dearly, is just beginning now to get in the way of my personal life. And you know, Catherine, I've saved a couple of bucks, okay, so I don't have to work as much as I used to. You know, I'll still work some, but it's, it's coming in five nights a week that's getting to be a little bit tough. I can understand. Yeah. I mean, this is not heavy lifting, believe me. How long has it been since you didn't have some place to go and something to do, though? Uh, since I was about uh, 16 years old, huh? It's, yeah. it's going to be hard to quit. I beg your pardon? It will be hard to stop. No, it won't be. I'll tell you, um, thanks to a very nice man who worked at ABC back in the 80s, I had a 58-week paid vacation. Actually, a guy at ABC paid me some money not to work for NBC, as it turned out. <laughs> And, you know, in those 58 weeks, I, you know, Catherine, I couldn't get it all done every day. There were so many things I did in my life when I wasn't working full time, you know, involving my family, my mother, my personal life. I, I was busy and happy and content not coming in every day. So I don't, I, I don't see a major adjustment coming forward. But anyway, enough about that. Catherine, you're very kind to call, and I appreciate you taking the time. We'll miss you. Well, you helped save this show tonight, Catherine, because without you, the viewers, you know, we got nothing here. Thanks again, Catherine. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Uh, to John in Lylesville, North Carolina. Hi, John. You're on the air. Hello. How you doing, Tom? I'm okay, John. Good. Um, you know, you said that um, you just wanted to end with a lot of class. Well, yeah. that's um, the only way you can end. Um, a class act can only end with class. Well, you'd be surprised what I do off camera. <laughs> 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 I get a little nuts. So. <laughs> but, you know, um, you've, you've done countless number of interviews, but I know one that was memorable for me was watching you and Lou Holtz, two legends, on the same stage at the same time, being a sports writer myself. Was that the, was that the night that he did the uh, the uh, newspaper? Dis remember he yes. tore, tore up yes. the newspaper? It was the I, know, I, I, I tried to get through feverishly that night. But, yeah. Um, yeah, that was the same night. But of all the people that uh, you've interviewed, who's got to be the most rewarding, would you say? Oh, man, there have been so many through the years. I, you know, I can't, I really can't pick one. Uh, I mean, Alfred Hitchcock, way, way back at NBC, you know, 25 years ago. And uh, William Wellman, the movie director. Uh, uh, Ayn Rand, uh, the, the, uh, the great author of Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead uh, back, in the, back in the 70s. I mean, there's, there's been so many, John, I really can't pick one for you. And you mentioned Jack Nicholson and Johnny Carson as two dream guests, but anybody else? Well, right now, John, I'm, you're Anybody one of the best else. I've had, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are going to miss you, and, uh, you know, whatever you do, we know it's going to be successful, and we'll look for you in the future somewhere. Okay, John. I, hey, right, listen, man. you may not see me, kid, but I'll be right around the corner, okay? Thanks a lot. All right, John, be well. Bye now. All right, thank you, and thanks to all who picked up the phone and called here tonight. Uh, you, if you were expecting to see Waylon Jennings, uh, he, 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 he left early. You know, last night we got on late, right? What we should have done is just signed off after Dr. Sure. Laura and given CBS back the 18 minutes they made us wait last night. <laughs> how, many, how, many, how many minutes was it? 
19. 19, giving them back those 19 minutes. But we don't operate that way because we want to finish with class. <laughs> we'll be back to tell you about tomorrow night's program uh, when the guests hopefully will be here right after these messages. Tomorrow night, the uh, former White House press secretary, news secretary, D.D. Myers, is here tonight. And, and I hope not so much to talk about all that's happening back there involving the president and uh, the special prosecutor and uh, Ms. Lewinsky and all that, but rather about if you're a presidential press secretary, and uh, how do you front for the White House when things are tough? Like, like this fellow uh, who's, uh, who's uh, fronting uh, for uh, 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 Clinton. Mike uh, yeah, Mike McCurry. I'm getting to the name. Thank you. It's okay. Thank, I appreciate your help, Mark. Believe me, I need a lot of help out here. How he does it day after day, and I hope you'll join us then. Man, if you thought yesterday was bad, wait till you see what happens tomorrow. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>